Yes, all set for discharge. What was that? The repeat BP too high? How high? Okay, thanks. I'll be right there. Hmm. She's seven. Is her blood pressure high because she's just amped up? I mean, she came in for a simple lack repair. It's probably okay, but let me just check if there's anything in the EMR. Oh, that does make a difference. You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Hypertension in children. What is it and when do I need to do something about it? In adults, we can get pretty lenient when it comes to high blood pressure readings in the acute setting. As long as there are no symptoms and there's no need to go chasing changes in organ function, we typically take the long view in adults. We steer the hypertensive ship slowly over time back to its course and did I mention gingerly over time rather than risk an abrupt about face that can do more damage to the passenger than any good to the ship. In children we have to be a bit more in the here and now. We have to be vigilant. This isn't because we need to treat children like porcelain dolls afraid to do anything out of sorts. We take hypertension in children seriously because hypertension, real hypertension, can wreak more havoc in children in a shorter period of time. The tempo of the investigation and treatment should mirror the tempo of the disease. Today we'll talk about the definition of hypertension, categories of presentation, and what to do about each. <music> First, what's the definition of hypertension in children? You know, it's going to have to change with age, and then they throw in gender, and brace yourselves, there's a formula for under 13 and over 13, and then there are separate formulae for the different levels of hypertension by age category, and then, oh boy. The American Academy of Pediatrics published new guidelines that remind me of the old saying about the camel. You heard it. A camel is a horse designed by a committee. There's just so much stuff there, but instead of sleek horsepower, we get a lot of chewing cud. When you read the guidelines, they're well-intentioned, but impractical. Just for starters, trying to figure out who is hypertensive requires a degree in higher math. Okay, not really, but it's just impossible to internalize. And the danger I see here is when our own fixed internal biases to minimize take over. It's too complicated, too esoteric. Obviously, the kid is fine. It must not be a real problem and not my problem. We can all get trapped there unknowingly. So instead of relying on alerts from your electronic medical record, which, as we all know, are just often wrong, and instead of running to a reference every time we see a new set of vital signs, I got some good news. I have a memory aid for you. Now, before I go on, please note that these guidelines, and so my modified version of them, they are extremely conservative. Just because a child has a reading in the hypertensive range does not necessarily mean he will be hypertensive. We'll go into more detail on that, but look at the patient, not just the number. So, here it goes. Remember this baseline number, 100 over 60. At age 1, you're allowed to be up to 100 over 60. Age 1, 100 over 60. Then, just add 1 millimeter of mercury per year to both numbers. So, at 3, you're 
103 over 63. At 5, 105 over 65. At 7, 107 over 67. At 9, add to 100 over 60. So you get 109 over 69. 11, 111 over 71. 13, 113 over 73. Until you get to the adult nirvana of 100 over 80. See what I mean by conservative? So again... If you're an otherwise healthy 27-year-old who just so happened to be working like a dog all night and you're still kind of totally jacked on caffeine and you happen to have a reading of 127 over 82 in the morning, does that make you hypertensive? Probably not, but we need a place to start. I'm not so worried about patients in this range, but I'm also not a cardiologist. I'm not a nephrologist. Both may have their own perspective, their opinions, and their view. We can only speak to the emergent setting, and if you're in that zone, 100 over 60 at age 1, adding your age in millimeters per mercury as you go, then we can say that we are definitely, safely, totally, comfortably, and most decidedly not hypertensive. Now, before we get in there, raring to go, are you sure about this? How do I know it isn't spurious? Proper cuff size is important. The cuff should cover 50% of the length of the arm, so anywhere between 45 to 55%, half of the length of the arm. It should encircle 80 to 100% of the arm's circumference. So think, Wrap around, cover half. Make sure your automated cuff is calibrated for neonates and infants. Try to keep infants calm with distraction. Manual readings are always best. The automatic oscillatory devices measure the mean arterial pressure directly. Then they back calculate the systolic and diastolic pressures based on their own proprietary formula. So you're actually getting a calculated estimate with your automated cuffs. If you need to be sure, do it yourself. Wrist and forearm blood pressure measurements are slightly problematic in children and adolescents. In adults, there's good evidence to support their use, and sometimes you just got to go for it. In children, there are few studies showing the correlation with arm measurements to wrist and forearm blood pressure measurements, and they're just not recommended at this time. White coat hypertension is a real thing in children. It's a blood pressure measurement greater than or equal to the 95th percentile in the clinical setting, but less than the 95th percentile otherwise. It's estimated that up to 15% of children who are referred for elevated blood pressure or hypertension will actually end up having, after all is said and done, white coat hypertension. Remember also contextual hypertension. If a five-year-old just fell on an outstretched hand and has a both bone forearm fracture, his BP should be 120 over 65. Notice that it's predominantly the systolic that's raised. Compare 120 over 65 with what should it be? 105 over 65 in a five-year-old. So for now, it's okay. Treat his pain, reassess, take it easy. The BP is just too high. Now what? Primary hypertension is the predominant type of hypertension in children. It's also the predominant type in adults. We used to call it essential hypertension. It's unfortunate because 
it comes from a few things. A dollop of a hefty serving of bad diet. A slow drizzle of low physical activity. A sprinkle of a bit of family history and dust it with a hit of bad luck too. There are a few things that will make you feel better that this is a slowly developing primary hypertension and not something more sinister. The features typically associated with primary hypertension in children are older age, so greater than or equal to six years of age, a family history of hypertension, overweight, and obesity. Again, none of that is all that great, but it's usually caused by something modifiable, like following a plant-based diet or a Mediterranean-style diet, increased exercise, and just good habits. The degree of hypertension is not predictive of primary or secondary hypertension. Very high blood pressures can be associated with either of them. However, one thing to remember is that a solitary elevated systolic blood pressure is more likely to be primary. Any elevation in the diastolic blood pressure is concerning for possible secondary hypertension. Secondary hypertension is the more sinister version. In children, it can be from an extensive list of etiologies, including renal, cardiac, endocrine, environmental, genetic, or medication-related. Let's just breeze through them. Renal. The cause of the vast majority of cases of secondary hypertension, up to 80% is going to be renal. The younger the child, the more likely renal disease is. Cardiac. Coarctation of the aorta may present as asymptomatic hypertension in a school-aged child or adolescent. This often presents as hypertension with the right arm 20 millimeters of mercury higher than the left. When coarctation is found in infants, surgery is often needed. Older children and adolescents are often treated with stenting or angioplasty. Endocrine. This is a rare cause of hypertension in children with a long differential diagnosis, including all kinds of catechol problems, glucocorticoid problems, or mineralocorticoid excess, thyroid issues, or parathyroid disorders. Environmental. Lead, cadmium, mercury, phthalate exposure are rare causes of secondary hypertension in children. Genetic. Neurofibromatosis. Little syndrome, so the renin-aldosterone axis is off. Gordon syndrome, pseudo-hypoaldosteronism, and all of these other genetic issues. Thank God for geneticists and send-out labs. Medication-related. Oral contraceptive pills, corticosteroids, dietary supplements, caffeine, ADHD medications, TCAs, all of them can cause hypertension. Of course, always consider the occasional or regular use of cocaine and methamphetamines. Okay, we have an idea of why the blood pressure may be high, but what do I do now? In a stable patient, a good history and physical may be all that we need to do initially. Elicit compatible symptoms like concerning chest pain, shortness of breath, or poor exercise tolerance. This one's a good giveaway. Try to get a sense of whether the dizziness, abdominal pain, or back pain has anything to do with today's blood pressure measurement. It's tough because you don't want to lead them with your questions, but just get a general sense of wellness and try to hone in slowly by asking indirect questions like, oh, I see you like playing basketball. Mom, is he a good player? What do you think? Okay, so how do you feel when you're playing with your friends? Are you having a good time? Or do you ever have to stop while everyone else can keep going? Or something like that. Remember, young children want to please you with their answers, and they think that the affirmative is a good way to do that. 
older children act more like adults and they will agree to more symptoms because more is better and as long as that registers as taking their complaint more seriously. For the smaller children, don't forget perinatal history, especially gestational age and the need for NICU or neonatal nursery care. For everyone, ask about nutritional history, physical activity level, and psychosocial history, including chronic stressors like family disruption, bullying, which becomes more and more of a problem nowadays, and body perception issues. Also try to get a sense of what the family history is, anyone else, immediate family members with hypertension. If you're concerned that this is real hypertension, now is the time to get serious about taking the blood pressure. As we mentioned before, manual measurements are the best. To do this correctly, measure blood pressure in both arms and one leg. Remember, it's normal to have a slightly higher blood pressure in the legs, up to 10 millimeters of mercury higher in the leg than in the arm, and all this has to do with just the column of fluid. Do a focus history and a mindful physical exam. Focus on clues of the etiology of the hypertension. Proptosis, hyperthyroidism. Large neck circumference, think obstructive sleep apnea. But be aware that even the tall skinny kid can have large tonsils that cause the same syndrome. Look in the throat too. Abnormal facies, maybe moon facies, think endocrine abnormality. Skin changes, adenoma sebaceum and throw in an ash leaf, tuberous sclerosis, cafe au lait spots, neurofibromatosis, or to be honest with you, a really long list of genetic syndromes that are associated with these spots. A friction rub, a murmur, an apical heave, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Abdominal distension, chronic constipation, Maybe this is a neuroblastoma or any abdominal mass compressing the renal artery. Palpable kidneys? Think Wilms tumor. Abnormal genitalia? Renal or endocrine abnormalities. Joint swelling? Think rheumatologic disease. Use the patient's exam as your template for a possible etiology. Okay, I think we just maxed out our index of suspicion. Let's talk about what we can do about it now. If the child is asymptomatic and has a reassuring history and physical exam, then you should refer him to his primary care provider. Really, he needs a re-examination and potentially a screening. It's perfectly fine to do nothing else to investigate this in the emergency department as long as two things happen, in my opinion. A, the patient can't get in to see his doctor who may recheck it, and presto, there's no problem because it's all resolved. And B, the patient and family are educated about the importance of following up. Remember, we're only seeing this patient in a small sliver of time. It may or may not be an issue, but we just need to make sure everyone is on board. This is a tricky situation since... Many of our patients don't have regular access to a reliable clinician to the same clinician each time they come in for a visit. Nevertheless, the emergency department is for emergencies, and we should keep it like that. Our patients include everyone sitting in the waiting room and anyone on their way by ambulance or are about to call the ambulance who may have serious illness and who have not been seen yet. We are a precious finite resource. So don't let the ED become a walk-in clinic if you can avoid it. Always ask, what am I going to do with this information when I get it? It's always better to have someone who can get to know you over time. And this may be a way to prevent all kinds of iatrogenia. So sending the patient to the office is not just washing your hands of him. It's actually giving him the more appropriate care. Sometimes you're stuck and you got to go investigating, but sometimes it actually is better for the patient to let everyone cool off for a while, including the patient. In the office setting, after three separate measurements, 
ideally at three separate visits, after confirming that the child does not have simple white coat hypertension, then the office may or may not decide to do ambulatory BP measurement. It's the confirmatory test of choice. It consists of a BP cuff attached to a box about the size of a cell phone that records the BP every 20 to 30 minutes throughout the day and throughout the night. Data can then be downloaded and analyzed to everyone's heart's content. The problem with this, of course, is that we can only use it in children who are more than five years of age because they're the only ones who may tolerate it. In cases where there are signs, symptoms, or concerns for secondary hypertension with end organ damage, we may elect to do some more screening in the ED. Sometimes it's best for the child to just go ahead and do some screening tests. Remember, this should be for the child in which you feel that there probably is some secondary hypertension going on. The higher risk children, especially the ones less than six years of age and those who are not overweight or obese and do not have a family history of hypertension. In other words, the hypertension really is a surprise to you and the diastolic is elevated. Even then, the child's pediatrician can still pick up the ball from here, but sometimes you just got to do it. If you're going to screen, this is what you should do. Start with a urinalysis, chemistry panel, and complete blood count. You may also think about drug screening, and if you can get this result back or relay to the primary care provider, a TSH. If the child is less than six years of age, think about renal ultrasound. Because again, remember, renal etiology is more likely in younger children. Other non-ED screenings may include a sleep study or a fasting serum glucose, a lipid panel, and a hemoglobin A1c. You may be tempted to think about things like a chest x-ray or an EKG or troponin, but really those aren't screening tests. Those are to rule in or rule out something that you already have a pretty high suspicion for. EKG for left ventricular hypertrophy has a pretty high specificity, but it shouldn't be used as a rule out strategy. It shouldn't be used as a screening because LVH on EKG actually has pretty low sensitivity. You need that echo really if you think this child has left ventricular hypertrophy. If the parents ask you, should we buy a blood pressure cuff to have at home, I would sway away from that only because it shouldn't be used for the diagnosis or the management of high blood pressure in children according to the latest guidelines. Okay, my patient can totally go home. What can I recommend or prescribe to him for his hypertension? For children who you think they have hypertension because of some lifestyle issue, then talk to the parents. Talk to them about goals and expectations. Talk to them about increasing physical activity. Try to focus on positive words. Hey, Johnny's going to have more fun and feel better and be healthier if he does more activity. Another way that you can talk about weight is to say, you know, he can stay the same weight, he just needs to grow a little taller now. It all has to be proportional. It doesn't have to be a negative thing. He doesn't necessarily have to lose weight actively. He just has to grow out of it. Follow the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, and ask about things that are stressing him out. Starting antihypertensive medications is best left for the primary care physician. Who needs to be admitted for a workup? Most children with severe asymptomatic primary hypertension have been at that blood pressure for some time. If there's no evidence of end organ damage on history, physical examination, and potentially screening tests, then lowering the blood pressure slowly over time as an outpatient is the best strategy to balance risk and benefit. Acute, severe secondary hypertension, with or without symptoms, 
requires more aggressive intervention. So if this child already carries a known, verified diagnosis of secondary hypertension, maybe he has chronic kidney disease, maybe he has severe hypertension, now he has proteinuria, something is new. By definition, he's out of control. And remember, the tempo of the investigation and intervention should mirror the tempo of the disease. So if this kid is getting worse faster, we need to do something about it now. And he may have to come in for oral medications that need to be titrated over the next 24 hours. Or maybe we need to start a drip. Severe hypertension with symptoms or with end organ damage or significant comorbidities like renal disease or diabetes. We need to treat this very aggressively and oftentimes we do this with intravenous titratable drips. This is preferred to bolus dosing obviously as drips can be more titratable. Think about the things that we would often use in anyone. Esmolol, a popular beta blocker. It's short acting, it's great, it's on and off, but we have to watch for bradycardia. Labetalol, it's an alpha and beta blocker. We have to be careful if there's overt heart failure. Nicardipine, a calcium channel blocker. Great, nice and titratable, but it can also cause reflex tachycardia. Phenoldopam, a dopamine 1 receptor agonist, also can cause reflex tachycardia. The goal on a drip is to lower the mean arterial pressure by no more than 25% in the first eight hours. And then we slowly try to make this more normal for age over the next 24 to 36 hours. Don't bottom them out. Okay, a few little extra pearls from the guidelines. The term prehypertension is gone. Now we'll just say elevated blood pressure. Most cases of hypertension are due to primary hypertension, especially age six and older. So there's really no need to do an extensive workup initially in these children. Patient-centered care and family-centered care is obviously more important than healthcare-centered care. The point of this is to reduce unnecessary and costly medical interventions and investigations, and it actually improves outcomes. Secondary causes of hypertension should be investigated with emphasis on the detection of renal disease, the most common cause for children less than six years of age. Now, the bottom line. Blood pressure should be checked in all children and adolescents three years of age or greater at every healthcare encounter if they have obesity, renal disease, history of aortic arch pathology, diabetes, or are on medications known to increase the blood pressure. In other words, if they're at risk for high blood pressure, we should be checking for it. Children and adolescents greater than six years of age don't require an extensive evaluation for secondary causes of hypertension if they have a positive family history of hypertension, if they're overweight or obese, or if their history and physical findings aren't suggestive of any secondary cause. In other words, it's okay to slow that roll in children greater than six years of age who don't have any other risk factors. If you already have a comorbidity, like renal disease, then presenting with hypertension is a big deal that we have to address. In consultation with a child's nephrologist, with a home regimen adjustment, or in some cases, aggressively with a drip. So in summary, you have four main presentations of pediatric hypertension in your emergency department. The first, the child with white coat hypertension or situational hypertension. Repeat and refer. Primary hypertension. Repeat and refer. Secondary hypertension. Repeat and refer. Really, unless you have a real access issue, you don't need to do 
lots of screening tests in the emergency department. And lastly, secondary hypertension with a known or established comorbidity, like renal, cardiac, or any other known cause, this is a four-alarm fire. This child's hypertension is out of control, and we have to assume that it's causing end-organ damage. Stop there and address it. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.